Impact of Influence. Covering true crime throughout the Southeast. Hello, friend. Matt Harris and Seton Tucker here. Uh, We are dealing with the case of Jimmy Robertson, who killed both his mother and father in 1997 in Rock Hill, South Carolina. We have had an episode out, and we're going to continue to crank out episodes about this really intriguing case. Uh, Before we do that and bring in our guest, Seton Tucker, tell them about the two places they can find us. You can find us on Facebook at Impact of Influence or on YouTube, which the best place probably to access that is through our Facebook page. You're correct. Uh, You missed this interview. I know, and I was so disappointed because we had interviewed Tommy Pope about uh, Susan Smith. She was the woman from Union, South Carolina, who is uh, convicted of murdering her two sons and uh, up for parole, I believe, this fall. Yes. And he was one of my absolute favorite interviews that we've had. He's just so engaging and uh, interesting. So I was very disappointed that I missed this interview, but I was on vacation. Yeah, I'm going to get an extra listen this time This this is for this one from you. (laughs) Yeah, I will listen to this one for sure because I I, I just think he's amazing. Well, he was the lead prosecutor on the case, and here's our guest, Tommy Pope. Guest today, Tommy Pope. He's been on the show before, and we did the Susan Smith episode in 1992. Tommy was only 30 years old when he was elected to serve as the solicitor of the 16th Judicial Circuit of Union and York Counties in South Carolina. Uh, we've talked about the Susan Smith case before. You tried numerous murder and death penalty cases. And in uh, 06, your new chapter uh, began in private practice of law. 2008, Tommy was awarded the Order of the Palmetto, South Carolina's highest civilian honor for his dedication and service to the citizens of the state. And in uh, 2010, Tommy was elected to the South Carolina House of Representatives. And in 2014, Tommy elected Speaker Pro Temp by his peers and re-elected in 2016 to serve in that position, which he continues. Tommy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, there's a few, you've, like we said, you did a lot of murder cases. There are a few of the ones that really, I'm sure, stick in your head. And I know it's been 25 plus years, but uh, this whole case of you know people killing their parents is right. extra weird. And then the violence of it was you know, just, uh, just horrifying. Uh, so t- tell me, when did you first learn about the murders of Earl and Terry Robertson? Do you remember that? I think the law enforcement... Uh- and, you know, was working the case, um, you know, I hate to say this, but cases run back to back. You know, I might be in trial while a, another one's occurring. We we never have a concern with supply and demand in the criminal yeah. justice world, I don't think. But uh, but anyway, uh, I recall, um, um, you know, getting the contact from law enforcement. And to the law enforcement's credit, it happened pretty quick because it had been staged by Jim as a, a burglary. Mm-hmm. And um, when Jim and, and Meredith Moon, who was a friend that was with him, kind of hit the road, they were going up toward Pennsylvania to where the brother Chip was in school. And that was going to kind of be the alibi, too. And they actually took most of the items from the house, the, the as I recall, the clothing, some of the weapons, uh, uh, the the I think the baseball bat, maybe the knives, and put them in a, a trash bag and threw them in a, in a dumpster in Maryland about halfway up the road. And uh, due to the quick work by law enforcement, they were able to intercept Jim when he arrived in Pennsylvania and Meredith and actually backtrack and gather that evidence. And this was kind of in the, the early stage of still a DNA, you know, kind of it was getting, you know, more refined. It's so commonplace now. But we were able to to use that to match up. And so that trove of evidence, basically, that was discovered just, you know, on the side of the road in a dumpster. Unfortunately, they they got to it so quick that it, it, you know, hadn't been taken to the landfill really made a difference in the case. Did the when law enforcement was doing the interviews with Meredith and Jimmy, did they record those? And did you see those or was that something, you know, how did that work? Do you remember? As I recall, I don't remember you know a video or audio recording to the best of my recollection Mm -hmm. you know i just the the information they relayed what was really valuable to me in the actual trial didn't come into my hands until the middle of trial was 
on cross-examination, Jim had, um, because it was a death penalty case, and of course they had psychosocial analysis, you know, their experts to say why Jimmy got, did what he did. And uh, this Dr. Cassio was his, um, you know, the defense's chosen psychiatrist, psychologist. And Jim went at great lengths to detail it's almost like he took a pleasure from it, everything he did, step by step, what he did, how he did, how he waited till dad was in the shower to uh, go in and kill mom with numerous knives, knowing dad, you know, could possibly thwart him and knowing dad wouldn't hear if he was in the shower. And then he waited for dad coming out of the shower after he killed mom and uh, sprayed Tylex in, her fa in his face so he could kind of get the jump on him. Then he beat him with a baseball bat. But um, Jim just told in graphic detail to this expert, and because she testified, and under our rules of evidence, I'm allowed to have whatever notes she took. And unfortunately for Jim, he, he told in great, great, wow. it was almost like a play-by-play. -play. I mean, by the time the cross-examination was over, I, I literally was saying, and, and what did he do next? And what did he do next? And he would say things like, I didn't want to use the signed autograph bat because I didn't want to ruin it because Jeez. you know his whole motive was you know was inheritance his right. dad had retired his dad was hoping to buy a golf course that was kind of his lifetime dream and and Jim and possibly Chip didn't want dad you know what squandering their inheritance and so um Jim was just extremely graphic and and obviously to play that out for the jury it was in essence you know, like having a, a video or, or, you know, at least an audio book narration of, of what occurred. Jim, um, at one point after he killed his mother, he told Miss Cassio, one down, one to go. Jeez. And, you know, the dad wouldn't die. And he was thinking about going down to get the drill to, to drill into his head. Good Lord. Him. I mean, it was, you know, it was obviously um, when we're trying to show the character of the crime or the defendant, Jim was a great help in yeah. helping me show the jury the nature of his conduct. So you said by rules of evidence, so there's not a doctor-client privilege because they're an expert? Because that's something she relied on in her opinion. Okay, okay, so it opens you know, it up. It, because she's now testifying and advocating, you know, for him, because her, her whole position was, you know, that the, they, the parents were bad parents and poor Jim had, you know, no other alternative than to kill his parents, you know, based on, you know, the way he saw it. And, you know, they would take one time. I'll tell you, I grew up, my dad was sheriff in York County. I'm the runt of the litter. They call daddy Big Elbert. And uh, <laughs> if, back in the day, if I could have got DSS out to the house, I mean, he, he would be sense of me right regular. Right. But, you know, the world has changed, but, you know, you'd have one incident where Jimmy's mouthing at his mama or showing out and dad kind of snatched him up and they, you know, tried to roll that into, you know, a childhood of brutality. Um, you know, he was, he, he even went to college. He went to Georgia Tech. Jim was an Eagle Scout. He was very smart. Right. He went to Georgia Tech um, and according to Jim, intentionally flunked out just to kind of get at his parents. So, I mean, he's just, he was strangely strangely motivated. I, I remember closing argument. I said, Miss Cassio said, Jim had no alternative. I said, Jim's got an alternative. Why didn't they get off his butt, get out and go <laughs> get a job, you know, rather than sponging off his parents. Right. Uh, to, to go back to the beginning of the, what was the, what's the rules or were the rules of death penalty uh, in South Carolina and why did you decide to go sure. with that? And how does the jury, do they just say guilty and the death penalty? How does that play out? Okay, so in South Carolina, uh, the the way I always explain to people, uh, you know, our death penalty is reserved for murders primarily, and and it's a murder plus. In other words, again, not making light of any murder, murder, but it's a murder plus aggravating circumstances, and some of the aggravating circumstances can be killing of a child, um, killing of more than one person. It's it's kind of a laundry list. Uh, killing for money, um, killing a police officer. You know, it's just kind of a list. And so what you do in the, is, in the first stage is strictly about guilt or innocence. And there's a lot of evidence that doesn't even come in 
because the whole focus is did they do it, not whether they're a bad person. You know, it's just pure proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah. Then in the second phase, it really kind of opens up into um, a number of areas. Uh, there's something ironically called pain testimony, it's, but it's actually P-A-Y-N-E. It's from a case, uh, Payne versus Tennessee, but it was basically the case held that you can have victim impact testimony to show, you know, what happened. So that allows you, for example, to perhaps show actual scenes or crime scenes or pictures of the victims to see the brutality of the crime, where in the guilt phase, I wouldn't be able to show you that as a juror if it was just designed to kind of increase your passion, right. but didn't really tell you, did he do it, did he not? Um, and so the, the the victim impact is part the um nature of the character of the defendant. And that's where little things like, you know, the spite of, you know, dropping out of school intentionally, you know, because then I get to, you know, and the defense always, you know, brings that he's a victim or the psychosocial analyst part. Um, but I get to show, you know, his conduct and, and, and his character, because again, if the jury finds aggravating circumstances, then that leads them to then make in a second stage of a trial at the kind of a, it's not a trial within a trial it's a trial after a trial yeah. they get to determine guilt i mean uh, i'm sorry death life penalty. or death gotcha um yes let's, let's talk a little bit about meredith moon for instance uh, for a, a minute uh, we talked earlier before we started with you about how she was key to finding all that evidence so do the do the does law enforcement come to you and say here's what we recommend for meredith moon or do you cert you know, figure it out what you want to do how does that play out so Kevin Brackett, who's the solicitor now, was my deputy solicitor, and we we worked together, and he primarily dealt with Meredith. But we had to be very careful um, in not promising her anything because it's a credibility thing from cross-examination. You know, they could say, well, you know, you're, you're in the and, – and I think – let me back up. The evidence, I think, was clear. Meredith was kind of along for the ride. She was kind of a big girl. Jimmy paid her – some attention. He kind of manipulated her. Completely. I mean, she paid for her crime, you know, and, and went to prison. But mm -hmm. but I don't want to say wrong place at wrong time, but she chose to be involved where she probably shouldn't or didn't need to. Under normal know, so circumstances, she's not a murderer. Right. She's not a murderer. She wouldn't even be there. He calls her that night. And, you know, he, she goes over there. He's all, you know, Chip needs me. I need to go, you know, see Chip. He, you know, and then, um, you know, Jimmy's, you know, snorting Ridlin or whatever he does, and it kind of unfolds. But now, you know, you've been there, a murder's happened. It's kind of hard to just walk away, you know. And so she she went with him, but she came clean. And again, as I mentioned earlier, the evidence that was found somewhere in Maryland, I mean, she literally told him, I remember... It was unusual because it was an exit on the inside of the interstate, you know, on the left side, every once in a while you see there, there was a dumpster there. And I think she described the dumpster. And again, we were able to get that bag full of evidence. But so, so she was helpful um, with no promise of reward. I mean, she basically came clean, but we really did feel that, that she was, she made her own bad decisions, but she was a victim of circumstance. So what we had to do for a credibility standpoint is not promise her anything um, and then wait till the judge sentences her and then be able to say she was helpful. She was cooperative. OK, you know, because otherwise, you know, if there's a, you know, say Jimmy's facing life or death and she suddenly was offered you know, five years. I mean, it cuts it. You're sure you're going to tell us whatever we want to hear because you got a deal. Right. So right. we carefully did not give her a deal, but then we spoke truthfully about the, the help she had provided. Because she did not, if I get it right, did not get counsel right away. Right. She just, just told you guys. And so yeah, I, th th again, up, that was up in Pennsylvania. I, yeah. I think that's correct. But you would, if you followed up and said that, I, I would, you know, affirm it. Um, Talk just for a bit about Jimmy's demeanor during the trial. I watched some of the court TV. He did seem pretty sure. smarmy, like he was playing to the camera. Yeah. Am I getting that right? Yeah, I think Jimmy loves being the center of attention. Um, it was funny. Um, 
I remember one particular time, and, and so, you know, it's almost, and I was fortunate being the solicitor, it's almost like good cop, bad cop. He, Jimmy loved me and, you know, thought I was a consummate professional, and he hated Kevin Brackett. I, I remember one time Jimmy either said or sent me something that, you know, Tommy Pope's a professional, and uh, Kevin Brackett didn't even fit to shine his shoes. And I laugh <laughs> to this day, my little wooden, my little wooden shoebox, I printed that out. It's taped on the side of my shoebox. I like funny. to share that with Brackett any, any time I get a chance. But Jim was, um, you know, he had two attorneys. And I remember one time in particular, um, I was back, in, it was after a break. I came back in the courtroom. Jim's at the table, but his attorneys aren't there yet. Well, the judge will rise and we've got to get to work. And uh, the uh, judge says, the state ready to proceed? And of course, I said, yes, sir, your honor. And and they said, uh, is the defense ready to proceed? Well, the attorneys were out of the courtroom and Jim's there and he looks at me and kind of grins and he goes, yes, your honor. You know, he, he fancied himself <laughs> smarter than, than everybody there. And so um, he he had a large time being the center of attention until the verdict started coming back. I remember one, I think it was an AP photo or somebody where when the verdict came back and he's literally doing this, yeah, like that's going to magically make it go away. Which is the, the irony there is Meredith Moon says when he was murdering his parents, she was covering her ears because they were screaming. And now suddenly he's covering his ears to hear what his fate is going to be. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. His ultimate responsibility. So, you know, he received the death penalty. You know, I always tell victims, and, and this was unusual again, because much like the Smith case, the victim's family and the defendant's family are the same folks. You know what I mean? Oh. So it's all, you know, so, you know, you know, where, and, and a job as a prosecutor is not just to please victims, it's to do what's best for society and the community and so forth, but it's all always an interesting combination and when the defense brings somebody well i know his mother and she wouldn't have wanted him to be, have this punishment <laughs> and of course i'm thinking that's probably part of the problem with jim he didn't get the punishment he need you know, needed along the a little line. spoiled so, yeah uh, so, yeah he was right he was spoiled right and they, that family loved him and spoiled him and he caused them nothing but misery uh, behind the scenes of trial thing, I'm always kind of interested in, and I, how did you, what was the decision or how did you decide that Brackett's going to handle Moon? I know that he did the, the examination of her on the stand. Uh, you did closing. Uh, like, how, how do you decide that in general or even in this specific case? Sure. We normally divide it up. You know, one thing I was, um, always conscious, you know, like you said, I started when I was 30 years old and, um. You know, people said I didn't have any experience, and I always joke, when I got elected, we had the worst backlog in the state. We had murder cases backed up. Yeah. And I said, I guess the, the, the voters figured, heck, we can't do any worse than the other guy. We got the worst <laughs> backlog in the state. So yes, they elected Tommy. But I was always, I tried my first death penalty case about two months into to office and got a death penalty um, in 93, you know, right when I got sworn in. And so I was always cognizant of the need to, kind of not ask your troops to do anything that you wouldn't do. You know what I mean? So yeah. I tried cases, not just to grab the big cases from the assistants, but to make sure that that if I'm telling you how to do something, I want to prove you I've done it too. And so normally how it shook out just by my background with law enforcement and so forth is I would normally take the technical witnesses, not that Brad yeah. or whoever wasn't capable, and, and they would often take the, the lay witnesses or the citizen witnesses. And so generally we divided it out that, and, you know, Meredith was such a big portion that having him focused on that was important. And um, if I recall, I think Kevin probably did the closing in guilt and I did it in penalty, I yeah. think. Again. Um, and so we just kind of divided it and, and worked it as a team. Um, I had read that he, did he send you, did Jimmy send you Christmas cards? Yeah. So I always said the irony is um, you would literally, Jimmy knew how to behave. You know, the old Southern, he was raised right. He <laughs> knew what to do and could, and could 
bring it out when he wanted to. You know, it's almost like, uh, you know, Eddie Haskell off Leave it to Beaver. <laughs> you know, he's all sweet, sweet to Warden June Cleaver. But then, you know, when he's upstairs, he's telling Wally, we're going to climb out the window and go out this weekend or whatever. So <laughs> he was almost like that. But, yeah, for the longest time, he sent me uh, Christmas cards. And, I mean, you would have thought it was from the kid that grew up next door. You know, how your family is and blah, blah, blah. Oh, so it wasn't just like he signed it. He would actually, like, write a note to you. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I, somewhere, I, I'm sure I got them in the box. They can look at them after my funeral <laughs> or something. You know? But, but um, I remember um, when I retired in, in like 2006, I got a final card from him. Brackett and I laughed about it because he said something um, to the effect of, you know, good luck to you. Now you're going to go get a real job. And I was thinking, <laughs> you spent the you know, however many years, you know, kissing my rear end and suddenly now yeah. that I'm leaving, you know, you've called me, you know, so, so anyway, so maybe now he'd like Kevin and not like me. I don't know. Um, uh, his brother Chip, not charged with anything, couldn't find any reason to think that he was uh, involved other than the weird phone call at three in the morning or whatever it was. Um, tell me if this is true. Was there, did Chip have parties at the house where his parents were murdered? That is that is my understanding. So we weren't, I, you know, Jimmy um, never would do anything to implicate Chip. And with that phone call, I truly believe um, Chip, you know, based on kind of the totality, you know, not necessarily something I can prove beyond a reasonable doubt, but the totality of the circumstances that, um, you know, Chip was kind of egging Jimmy on, you know, I'm going to do it this time. I'm going to do it, you know, because they'd always say, you know, they'd talk about they should kill their parents and have the money. Or something. And so um, I truly believe that that Chip was at least involved in encouraging. But you, you talk about a windfall. Ultimately, then mom and daddy are gone. Brothers on death row. You're the only one left. So he got all the assets, you know, all the resources whatever happened i think he fell quickly into drug addiction and i had heard um of parties at the house with black lights that would you know show the blood spatter in the hall where where earl was beat down with a bat or the blood spatter you know in other words you you may take it off the wall but you know it'll phosphorus right. even you know proteins of phosphorus even even then and uh you know his mother in the bedroom where she was stabbed and so i've, I've heard that's the case now what's What's happened to him since? Uh, I I've not heard. I think he did some jail time, maybe for drugs, but I'm yeah. I'm I'd heard he did some that. not a lot, but he did some time. Yeah, don't know where. He, and I heard that he yeah. uh, did send a letter. I don't know to you or to somebody about don't let him out, don't let Jimmy out. Uh, it would be bad, but I don't know. Now that I don't. That would that would have that been would after your time. So I heard it was like two thousand six or seven. So yeah, you know the biggest thing. I I'll say that probably kept Jim in jail um, is, is Jimmy himself. Um, you know, death penalty cases, and I think I started to say this earlier, when when I deal with victims, I always say, you know, by then, life meant life. Of course, you know, we were dealing with a bigger issue of, of killing your parents than the fact of, you know, some particular set of victims trying to give them some closure. And, and so uh, um, when... I always tell victims that if we can try a death penalty case, but it, you you may try it two or three times. It almost always gets overturned on something. And number two, you're going to hear the defendant has the right to blank a thousand times, and you're not going to hear it the first time your loved one has the right to, you know. Right. To not get bashed in the head with a bat. You're, they have a right not right. to have that and happen. So what ends up happening is invariably – um, and again, because of this uh, interfamily thing, this is a little unique, but on most cases, you know, do you want to, to kind of move forward, remember your loved one, and let the guy who killed them go be a number in the prison? I'd have to worry about it. Or are you going to hear their name again and again and again? My, one of the first death penalty cases I, I tried um, was Maurice Hughes, who killed Deputy Brent McCants here. Mm. And it was a death penalty case. And Maurice is still alive. And his mother, Brent's mother, who passed away, you know, was there every time, you know, trying to see if he'd get executed. Trying, And so it, it drags the victims through. So yeah. the whole point with this whole thing is often death penalty cases are, are um, a, a more difficult chase for victims than, than the 
payoff may be of, you know, sure, right. coming to fruition. Cause it's con constantly so, going to be in the news so every two years. Up, uh, but Jim decided at some point not to have his attorneys and that he would represent himself on his appeals. <laughs> and uh, because he's smarter than everybody. Sure. Of course kind of he is. What you're talking about. And uh, I think what Jim did effectively was totally screw up his appeals and um, increase the likelihood that before I die, one of the few people I have on death row that might actually get executed may be Jim because of his own thinking he's smarter than everybody else. That's a, a lot of uh, people are in jail right now because of that theory, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah. Tommy, so many different levels. Yeah, yeah. Tommy, so great uh, chatting with you again. I really appreciate you taking time for your busy schedule and, and talking to us about this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Not a problem. You take care. I'll talk to you anytime. All right, Tommy. Thanks, man. There you go, Tommy Postoff. More episodes about the Jimmy Robertson case from Rock Hill coming soon. Matt Harris, Seton Tucker, Facebook, and YouTube channel. We'll talk soon, friend.